was walking up the East Coast Sea, I saw a big city there in front of me. So many lights and shiver up my spine, I sure had a pretty skyline. Hey, friend, what's that town called? New York City. Hello again. This is Gary Fielder from Denver, Colorado. On the fifth episode of our podcast, in which we try to cover some topics that are topical, um, but we're not really a news outlet. And although we may be commenting on things that are in the news, in today's world, we hear about things so quickly that if you try to make a podcast about it, even the next day, it's already old news. So we try to cover general themes about what's been happening in our class action lawsuit and appeal. And the other issues that also surround that case and, and sort of underpin the constitutional issues um, that are the foundation of the case and, and are what we want to talk about in terms of all these uh, issues that we're battling with as, as not only citizens of the United States, but as just people generally. Now, I want to update everybody on the situation. Um, we did finally have our opening brief filed and accepted by the 10th Circuit with regard to the sanctions issue. To get everybody caught up, um, myself and co-counsel Ernest Walker from Michigan filed a civil rights case against certain entities and persons uh, the subject of which we're going to be talking about today, that is the, the subject matter of being a person and what that means in the law. Um, but we filed the case in December of 2020, and thereafter we were essentially threatened with sanctions by some of the persons uh, who, were the defendant, who were the defendants in the case, including Dominion Voting Systems, Inc., Facebook, Inc., which is uh, now Metaverse or something to that effect, Center for Tech and Civic Life, who we call CTCL, and others. So in that regard, while we were battling with these uh, issues as to whether we were frivolous or not, uh, we were responding to certain motions to dismiss, which were ultimately granted in April of 2021. The case was dismissed for lack of standing. In that regard the district court in the district of Colorado indicated that the plaintiffs didn't suffer an injury there was no controversy that they didn't have a particularized injury associated with the conduct of these uh, defendants in the 2020 presidential election the substance of the order was based upon the findings in other cases wherein those plaintiffs were found to have not suffered a concrete and particularized injury. So when you looked at those cases, they seemed to be similar to our case. They seemed to be making the same factual allegations, but as we've tried to demonstrate and as a part of our appeal, which has already previously been filed, the opening brief in that case was filed back in September of 2021 and is on our website, dominionclassaction.com. A response was filed in the standing, the dismissal of this, the, the case based upon lack of standing. And then our reply was filed later in December of 2021. Well, after the case was dismissed and after the notice of appeal was filed with regard to the issue of standing, which has not been ruled upon by the Tenth Circuit, well, these motions for sanctions came rolling in against myself and co-counsel Ernie Walker. Well, the court may or may not have had jurisdiction to even hear those motions while the appeal was going on. But in the end, we knew that whatever posture we took, the court either had jurisdiction or didn't have jurisdiction. We were going to file our responses, and we did. And then there was a hearing. Uh, it was was set for arguments on the motion. We appeared at the hearing and were sort of interrogated by the judge and, and that didn't really go over very well. You know, we were just uh, 
on our backs talking about what sort of research we did and, and did you call these people and, and why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? And we're like, well, we just filed our complaint. It's all in there. All the sources are cited. You know, we were relying upon the under oath affidavits of other people. And, you know, we watched their interviews. We judged their character and every affidavit was a part of a greater picture, a sort of a mosaic of evidence. We described it a hundred times, but the court ultimately sanctioned us for filing a frivolous lawsuit. And part of that was you shouldn't have even made an argument with regard to the standing of these people. You should have known they didn't have standing. The facts themselves were obviously frivolous because there was no fraud and, and, and the systems worked fine. We weren't even really talking about voting machines. We were talking about a company, a person called Dominion Voting Systems, Inc. And, and their responsibility for not carrying off an election in the swing states, and although they were in multiple other states, their sort of breach of their constitutional duty as state actors, that's what we've alleged, is that Dominion Voting Systems, Inc. is a state actor. So all of the vote count with regard to their systems, which includes the receipt of the mail-in ballots and the lack of certification, they were interwoven with the state. They have to take responsibility for, for all of it, not just how the machines counted. That's only a part of it. But when you take over a whole system, well, you're responsible for that system. So that's what we were saying in the complaint. Of course, the people, the registered voters, as a class of registered voters, they have standing if their rights were violated, and we're going to go over that today in terms of that issue of personage. Well, they have the standing, and they weren't trying to stop a state or stop the count. They were suing those responsible for the damage which was created by their misbehavior, specifically in the 2020 presidential election as a national right. We've only said all of these general concepts since the beginning of the lawsuit, which has been going on now for well over 15, 16 months. And we've made multiple videos in this regard explaining our non-frivolous basis for filing the lawsuit. Well, since the frivolous issue sort of trailed the substantive issue, um, the court didn't issue its order with regard to the actual sanction, which was the payment of $190,000 and other person's attorney's fees, such as Facebook's fees and CTCL's fees and Dominion's law fees and the state of Michigan's fees and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's fees. We don't even know what they were doing there. No, no governments were sued, but these attorney generals showed up and threatened us. And uh, so we had to pay, we had to, we are literally been ordered to pay the fees of the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the fees of the Attorney General of the state of Michigan um, who entered their appearance on behalf of uh, individuals that weren't even sued, that is the governor and secretary of states. Those individuals were sued in their individual capacity. We've said that a hundred times on these videos. So since that was sort of after the fact, the briefing schedule was after the fact and since it was us appealing the magistrate's order, it wasn't our clients appealing their lack of standing. It was really Ernie and I, as the appellants, appealing the judge's sanctions on us. So the opening brief uh, was due sometime in February, I think, and we had to seek a, a, a short extension. And we got that extension and... Um, we ultimately filed the corrected appellant's opening brief that was an issue with regard to the appendix. And of course, when you change the appendix, you gotta go back and correct the brief with regard to the citation. But we got it filed and it's been accepted April 8th, 2022. And it's up on the website if you wanna review it. This is really a different brief altogether. The first opening brief was with regard to the standing of the plaintiffs, the class, has never been certified. We didn't even get out of the batter's box. We didn't even really get to run out to first base because the umpire called us out in the batter's box just looking at us and said, hey, get out of here. You're not on the team. You're not on the baseball team. Get out of here. You're out. Get out. Uh, we didn't even get there. So um, that was with regard to the standing issue. This is with regard to whether the attorneys that filed the case 
were frivolous, whether there's any basis in fact, any basis in law. And so it was a totally different um, set of cases and issues around it, surrounding the issue of, of whether we were frivolous. It included the issue of whether we should have known our clients didn't have standing. And so there was a little bit of cross-reference, but, but in the end, you can look at the, um, you can look at the brief, you can see the formatting, you can see how much work we put into it, you can see the arguments that we made. I, I dare say they're not frivolous. It's all here and, and it's all outlined and, and, and we, we really took our time and we really tried to do it right. Uh, we've sort of been fighting this battle by ourselves, um, but I'm hopeful that this will at least convince the Tenth Circuit, even if it agrees with the district court that the clients don't have standing, which I don't see how they could do that. Maybe there's something that we missed or maybe they'll, they'll you know, find something else to deny the, the claim. But in the end, we certainly weren't frivolous in bringing the claim. So in that regard, I wanted to start from the basics because there's so much misinformation, not just in terms of what might not be true or because it comes from a source that is either illegitimate or maybe an agent trying to subvert a situation or put false information into um, a particular uh, topic or set of facts, you know, I mean, the, the 2020 presidential election is a topic. And so when you're trying to discern what the facts are, well, if people are purposely putting misinformation into that set of facts, it's very difficult to, to tell what's true or, or not true. So we've been sort of doing that from the beginning. And sometimes you might be wrong. Sometimes you might be duped, but that doesn't mean that all of your information is wrong. You know, if one particular expert was proven to be false or, or maybe even an imp, a, 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 a plant, well, then you just have to take that, sort of surgically remove it and still see if the evidence supports what your claims ultimately are, which is that these corporations and other persons impacted the, in a negative way, they burdened or otherwise um, infringed upon the voting rights of the plaintiffs, which might include everyone else. And of course, we've talked about that before. If you are a registered voter, you are in a class. Now, it might be a big class, but our argument is that you are in a class. And so in order to understand this, there, I think, and I'm not giving legal advice, I'm just giving my personal opinion and commentary, I think there's just been a big misunderstanding with regard to some of the underlying foundational information. Not an attempt to subvert or an attempt to, to misinform, but a major misunderstanding. So in order to understand who you are, in order to understand what your rights are, in order to understand whether your rights have been infringed upon or what your rights are to express yourself, you have to really understand who you are, which is based upon the Constitution and our laws and our citizenship and our ultimate inalienable rights as human beings. So we start with this concept. When you are born in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. And instead of thinking about who's excluded from that citizenship, whether or not your parents were here on vacation and you just happened to be born here and then you went back to France and enjoyed your French citizenship. Were, were you a citizen? Well, how about someone whose parents were both here illegally but residing here and you were born? Well, we, we deal with that all the time. Well, that person is a citizen of the United States. They were born here. So instead of thinking about the exclusion of those who may not be citizens of the United States. Forget all of that. Just concentrate on yourself, because if you're listening to this video, you're probably interested in voter integrity. And if you're interested in voter integrity, you likely are undoubtedly a citizen of the United States. So you don't have to worry about who is or who isn't. You are. You were born here. 
you've got a birth certificate, you've got a driver's license, doesn't matter what your gender is, doesn't matter how you identify, doesn't matter what your race is, doesn't matter what your age is, you can't vote until you're 18 anyways, can't be an adult in this country until you're 18 anyways, so there you go. If you're over 18 and you're registered to vote and you've got a social security card and, and you're interacting with commerce, well, you're a citizen of the United States, don't worry about who's not, you are. If you're a citizen of the United States, then like almost everybody else, you kind of have the same rights. And that can be depressing because you, you kind of want to think, well, you know, I'm a citizen of the United States. I, I have more rights. Well, not really. As a citizen of the United States, your power is found in your sovereignty. Your sovereignty is you as a private, autonomous, free individual, meaning you're one of the people. You are one of the people in a country that protects those rights. But those same rights are shared by everybody across the world. Because if you're a human being, you have a right to remain silent. That is an inalienable right. Now, you may not live in a country that defends that right, but you have that right. That's an inalienable right. So the right to remain silent, as I've said many times, is really just the right not to be tortured. So if you have a right to remain silent, well, then that right means they can't torture you to speak. So it's not about your freedom of speech. That's another right. That's an inalienable right. Well, maybe you live in a country where the politics and government doesn't support that right, but you have a right to speak. Maybe even in the United States, you're in a prison cell where your right to speak is being infringed upon because you can't speak as loudly as you'd like to speak from your prison cell. Well, we enumerate those rights through our filter of reasonableness, and sometimes you waive your rights by your conduct. And sometimes the people in their sovereign capacity create a state and that state passes laws against certain conduct and builds a prison and puts you in it. So as long as the process is due, as long as it's fair process, as long as it's due process, well, your rights as a person, because a foreigner can break the law and a foreigner might get criminally charged and a foreigner might have to go to a prison cell, well, that person still has a right to due process, a right to freedom of speech, a right to counsel, a right to cross-examine, a right to a jury trial, a right to appeal, a right to avoid cruel and unusual punishment. You see what I mean? So you don't have to be a citizen of the United States to enjoy most of those rights. You just have to be a person. An LLC is a person. A corporation is a person. And I know that that upsets everybody, but as long as you just remember that, then you don't have to get upset. The laws might require some of these corporations to make public disclosures, like their tax returns or their minutes or their, their board meetings might have to be filed with the Secretary of State. Well, they still have a right to remain silent if the board members are charged with a crime. If an LLC is charged with a crime, they, that LLC still can ask for a jury trial because the board of directors might go to prison over some crime that the person committed. So as long as we understand the differences between the people, and again, that doesn't include everybody, and that's not a mark on the Irish person or the French person or, or the Guatemalan or whoever it is that, that's not part of the people. It's just a, a designation for those of us who are clearly part of the people, who were born here, who participate in it, and who can identify themselves in some way. We're the people. Only the people can be registered to vote. So instead of worrying about people that might be dead or people that might be illegal and, and shouldn't be registered to vote, you should really just know who you are and what your rights are in terms of that real register to vote because yours is not fake, okay? When you are part of the people, that means you have a beating heart. That means that when you breathe into a mirror, it leaves a fog that you can put a line through. So that's where the sovereignty rests. 
In the old days where the king and queen had the sovereignty, they slept with the sovereignty. You sleep with the sovereignty. The power of this country comes from you and your breath and your beating heart and your blood. Back in the day, you had to be of royal blood. Now you don't. Your blood has to circulate. You have to be alive. But if you are a citizen of the United States and you were born here, you hold the sovereignty. Now, your ancient and founding fathers and mothers delegated some of that authority to the governments that the people created, such as the United States of America. That's a government. The United States, well, that's a corporation that acts as the government to interact in commerce. The states themselves were created by the people. Certain powers were delegated to th those institutions. The representatives that interact in those institutions are elected by, you could say, the people. But this is where it gets a little sticky. Remember when you were in high school, and a trial lawyer always likes to try to connect with something that we all remember from high school. Remember when you were in high school, somebody would say, teacher might say, well, you know, back in the olden days, you had to be a landowner to vote. And, you know, that meant being a white male. Well, that's bad. We, we don't do that anymore. Well, we kind of do. It's no longer just white males, but you have to give the clerk and recorder your name and a physical address. Well, that's your land. Even if it's a couch that you live on, that's where your land is. Now, most of you don't live on a couch, so don't worry about the borderline of who could be a landowner or not. Most of you have an apartment that you rent. If it's uh, month to month, when you pay that rent, that's your kingdom. Not the hotel room. That's on the road. You live in an apartment. You pay that rent. That's your kingdom. You can call yourself Queen Henry VIII or King Elizabeth. Doesn't matter who you are. That's your kingdom and your sovereign in it. And nobody can tell you otherwise. However, when you walk out the door and you start interacting with public actors, then you become a person. And in that realm, it's a hard, cold, equal world. So when you get in your car and you drive, well, you're in your personage. You have a driver's license with your all cap name on it. You're interacting with commerce because there's trucks around and you could get in a wreck. Now, you could say, well, I have a right to travel. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean a right to drive. The, the person, the, 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 the sovereign individual can sit in the back seat and travel wherever he or she wants to go. But in order to drive, you're interacting with commerce. You're, you're, you're in your personage. When you register to vote, you are interacting. You're giving your name. You're giving up your physical address. That's a big deal. It'd be better just not to register to vote. Just stay home and be left alone. Enjoy your own rights and privileges without any interaction. But when you give up your name and you give up your address and you're going to cast a vote, well, now you're interacting in your personage. Maybe your natural personage, but, but your personage. Corporations don't have a right to vote. So there are certain rights that all persons have. And there are certain rights that only the people have. Now, one reference that I like to talk about is the old Black's Law Dictionary. This is a different language altogether. It looks like it's English. And when you, you look at the words, they look like English words, but they're really legal words. And they might have a different definition. So when you look at Black's Law Dictionary and you look for the word people, well, people means the state. And then when you go to the S's and look up the word state, state means the people. So the people are the state and the state is the people. Now, if you're a foreigner, you're not really part of the people, so you're not really part of the state. You can't really register to vote 
and although you might have the full panoply of other rights, you're just not part of the people. If you look at the Constitution and really read it, it's very interesting that some of you may not know that there is a distinction between the people and persons. This distinction is not always recognized by the Supreme Court, but it nonetheless exists. For example, the First Amendment prohibits the Congress from making any laws respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Well, that's for everyone. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That's for everyone. Those are in inalienable rights. But keep reading. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Well, that's not everyone. Only the people have the right to peaceably assemble. Others can peaceably assemble, but, but in terms of enforcing that right, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Well, that seems to be reserved to the people. Well, that's a little different. Let's look at Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. What is the state? The people. What are the people? A state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, that doesn't include corporations and LLCs. That could be persons, okay, or foreigners who could be persons, but they're clearly not the people. Corporations are not the people. That is the beating hearts on the land. That's the people. Now, when you keep going, it's very interesting. The Fourth Amendment talks about the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. It shall not be violated unless there's a warrant upon oath or affirmation from the magistrate. You know, the search warrant, all of that. Well, that same right really shouldn't extend to persons because the Fourth Amendment clearly declares that right to be protected as part of the panoply of rights of the people. Now, move to the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment. It's the person that is not subject to double jeopardy. It's the person that should be able to compel the witnesses or not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. See, if you're a corporation, you have those rights. A corporation doesn't have a right to bear firearms. A corporation uh, doesn't have a right to be secure in its persons or houses. It probably is, but, but that's been extended. But of course, a corporation has the right to remain silent in a criminal case or uh, confront witnesses against it and right to due process. If you go to Amendment 6, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, impartial jury, um, again, confrontation of witnesses and, and uh, the, those other things, including counsel and, and the like, assistance of counsel for his defense. Well, that's for all persons. So some rights are enjoyed by all persons, and some rights are reserved to the people. The right to vote is a right that might be only shared by the people, but is an expression of your personage. And so in that regard, not everybody has that right. And that's the important part. We all have inalienable rights to a jury. If we live in a country that doesn't give us a jury trial, well, still an inalienable right. We ought to be given that. We have a right to counsel. Everybody has a right to counsel. And if you live in a country that doesn't give you right to counsel, well, your rights are being violated. Everybody has a right to remain silent, compel the attendance of witnesses that are testifying against them, right to call witnesses on their own behalf. These are all inalienable rights, due process, protection of life and liberty. These are rights that are extended even to corporations. But the people reserve other rights, and those are the rights to... Uh, 
assemble, rights to bear arms, and, 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 and in essence, the right to register to vote. But in the end, once you make that registration, you become a person with that right granted to you. And that makes a big difference because you're in the personage realm at that point. And in that regard, I wanted to uh, violate one of my rules, which is to um, mention someone else's tweet, which we all hate because uh, mentioning someone else's tweet just recognizes the, the, uh, the whole Twitter concept. But I wanted to uh, read a tweet and show it on the screen by Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez. You can see it there. This is um, re retweeted by, by someone else, but, but I'm just going to read it from, from her tweet. How is it that the party who believes corporations are people are suddenly trying to police who is a woman and who isn't? These are the same people who think Arby's is a legal human being. I don't see them assigning genders to their shady little LLCs. Give me a break. Now, I'm only using this for demonstrative and educational purposes because it demonstrates the lack of knowledge that even a representative of the House of Representatives for the United States may have about these terms. So let's break it down. How is it that the party who believes corporations are people? Well, she's obviously referencing the Republican Party and their struggle with the newly appointed Supreme Court justices' inability to define what a woman is. However, this particular representative is making reference to a party who believes corporations are people. Well, I'm not a Republican, but I can say that I don't think Republicans believe that corporations are people. Republicans probably believe that corporations are persons because Democrats believe corporations are persons. Independents believe corporations are persons. Libertarians believe corporations are persons because corporations are persons. They're not the people. And no party believes that because that would just be a false belief. But the fact that she can't distinguish between the two is worrisome. Now, she goes on. These are the same people who think Arby's. I don't know why she picks out Arby's. Maybe because they have the meats, I don't know. But these are the same people, again, I, get, I think re referring to Republicans, who think Arby's is a legal human being. Well, again, she's mixing the terms here. Arby's is a person, it's a legal person, but it's not a legal human being. And she finishes with, I don't see them, again, meaning Republicans, assigning genders to their shady little LLCs, as if the party that she belongs to doesn't have shady little LLCs. But those shady little LLCs are persons. They're not human beings. And they're not part of the people. Even that's different. We've already gone over that in this boring Podcasts. If you're a human being, it doesn't mean you're one of the people. If you're one of the people, you're likely a person because you likely have a driver's license and are likely registered to vote and are likely interacting in commerce. But even then, you could be one of the people and just stay home. But if you interact with the world of persons, then you're interacting in that personal world. A message from Save Our Suffrage. As you might remember, we are a 501c4 nonprofit organization, also doing business as Dominion Class Action, which was founded by plaintiffs and supporters like you. I speak for the team when I say that we are proud to bring you the Fielder Principal Podcast and to share with you a message of peace, 
hope, and unity for the nation. It is all of our duties to respond to these attacks on our nation by peacefully advocating through the courts and legislatures for your constitutional right to vote, to organize grassroots activism, to peacefully defend every voter's civil rights, and to further educate and empower yourselves and every citizen of this great nation with the tools of justice and peace that each of us require to save our suffrage. We are extremely grateful for the continued support from you and so many other people who believe in working towards a fair and honest society where every vote is respected and treated equally under the law. Thank you for hanging in there with us. We will keep you posted as we continue this important work to save our suffrage and the work of Dominion Class Action. To all my fellow American heroes, the age of freedom has just begun. Be at peace. Thank you. To pick up where we left off, if you are one of the people and you hold the sovereignty and you hold the power and you understand that part of that power has been delegated to the several governments that the people have created, including the 50 states and the federal government, then when you register to vote, which may require you being one of the people, when you enforce that right to vote, you are becoming a person going to court, filing a case. Once you interact in that way, you are interacting in your personage, which is all fine and good, but what are you trying to enforce? You're trying to enforce your right to vote. Now, that could mean one of two things. Your right to vote in your state election for what we call the down ballot issues, which I've talked about before, or the one national right that all voters have to vote for the, for the president and vice president of the United States. So you think about that right. And wherever that right exists in you, either as one of the people or in your personage, whichever one. You may have to enforce that right through your personage, but that right is part of your beating heart. It is part of your worth. And that is not a right that everybody in the world shares. That is not a right that all the people share. That is a special right. You are in a class, there might be 160 million of you, but you are in a special class of those who can vote. And if you, as a person in this world, much less as a part of the people which holds the sovereignty, can actually vote for your chief executive officer, which happens to be in your country, the United States of America, the commander and chief of the armed forces, that is the most precious right you could ever grant to a human being. If you can have the right to vote for your president of France, that is a gigantic right. Now, none of us share in that right. If you can vote for your chief executive officer in Great Britain, which you cannot do, even the prime minister is part of their representative uh, framework, but they still have the king and the queen and all of that bit. Well, nobody votes for Queen Elizabeth. She's just the queen until she dies. So the fact that we created a system wherein some of the people can vote, that right is the most extraordinary right that you can have. And it defines who you are as the person in your living room, which is 
you as a human being, you as part of the people. When, you know, if I'm in my house, my name is Daddy or Honey or Gary. People come over and say, hey, Gary, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How you doing? Bill or Betty or whoever that beating heart is. But as soon as someone asks me a question about the law or someone calls me at 3 o'clock in the morning because they've been arrested, well, I, I put on my professional hat. I get into commerce. Now I become Mr. Fielder or Attorney Fielder. That's me and my personage. As soon as I answer the phone, I could be speaking to a friend that's in my capacity as a human being, as one of the people, whatever it might be. But as soon as I cross the realm of speaking to someone about a case or, hey, I just got arrested, I become a person. I become an attorney. The first phone call with a friend wasn't really protected by the attorney-client privilege. This one is because I'm talking to an accused. So we're working in our personage. So even though you don't have the inalienable right to vote, that's a special right granted by the state created by those sovereign people, once you have that right, it becomes a fundamental right. So it's not inalienable. If you commit a felony, it could be taken away from you. It could be alienated from you. It can be leaned upon. It's not inalienable. It's not unleanable. It can be separated from you. But if you have it, then it's priceless. It really is what we fight the wars over. So, if one of those sovereign states starts unconstitutionally interfering with your right to vote for president, you can't sue that state for money. 11th Amendment, we said it a hundred times. You could file an injunction to try to stop the state, and that's where the Linwood cases came from and the Sidney Powell and other cases came from. They're suing they're suing persons in their official capacity, meaning they're suing the states to try to stop the state. That's not prohibited by the 11th Amendment. They're not suing for damages. They're suing under the ex parte young fiction. See, under ex parte young, you can sue people in their individual capacity because they're not in their official capacity if they're violating the Constitution. If a detective violates your rights, you can sue the police department, but that's under different theories of liability. You sue the detective in his or her personal capacity because an objective detective never violates the Constitution. So if someone does an unreasonable search, well, then the person that's the victim of that sues the detective in their individual capacity. They don't have 11th, immunity, 11th Amendment immunity, ex parte young. So we call it an ex parte young fiction when voters or whoever it might be comes to court to try to stop a state. Our case involves plaintiffs who are the people because they're registered to vote and only the people can be registered to vote coming to the court in their personage as voters because when you come to court you come to the court as Mr. O'Rourke, you come to the court as Mr. Yarborough, you come to the court in your all caps official capacity. So you come in your personage. And in our case, our clients, these, these citizens who are citizens and who are part of the people coming in their personage as voters are pointing to these private corporations who are persons and these other individuals not in their sovereign capacity. We didn't sue Mark. We sued Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Zuckerberg. Mark didn't do anything from his living room. He did it from his business in his professional capacity as the CEO of a major uh, uh, social media network. We're suing Facebook or Metaverse, whoever they are, in their personage because they violated the rights of the persons that are our clients. So, so that's really where all of this comes from. We're not trying to stop a state. We didn't sue any of the individuals that we initially named in their 
official capacity. But this misunderstanding of what the people are, what persons are, and how we're interacting in society leads to a lot of this information. And it's not just people like AOC. Look at President Trump. Call me Donald, he says. Well, we're not in his living room talking about the dolphins. Once we say, well, Mr. President, I'd like to talk to you about this policy. Well, what do you need, Jim? Or you know how he always introduced people by their, by their first name. Come up here, Betty. Or, uh, come up here, Bill. No, 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 no. That, 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 that's, I mean, he, he, he introduced the Supreme Court justices by their first name. Come on up here. You know, he say their first name, even the, you know, the female nominee, you know, come on up here. And he, and he said her first name. Well, she's not there in her personal capacity, even though she might have her husband and, and all their kids. You know, she's there in her professional capacity. It's not Amy. Hey, come on up here, Amy. You know, it's Judge Barrett. So even President Trump didn't understand that. He thought that the people were persons and the persons are people and, and everybody's part of the people and aren't we just all one big happy family? No, no, all of these distinctions are meaningful and they're who you are. And they're, the reason you should be interested in this topic is because it defines who you are. Because really, honestly, your children are princes and princesses. You truly are a king or a queen or both or whichever one you'd like. You truly are. So the field or principle, what's the minimum required for the duty born, meaning the burden that we have? It's not about your privileges and your rights as the so-called sovereign or citizen of the United States. There's no sovereign citizenship. The sovereign is the part of the people in the living room. The person is the citizen because the citizen is interacting with other persons. So there is no sovereign citizenship. That's an oxymoron. So when you are acting in your personage with regard to your right to vote for president and other persons not protected by the 11th Amendment are burdening that right or infringing upon that right, how can it be said that you don't have standing? And how can it be said that when you, as the person, get counsel to forward your claim that your counsel is frivolous because you're trying to protect your rights in the court establish so that persons can vindicate their rights. So in the end, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about registered voters as persons that don't really have any special innate or inalienable rights, but have that special right to vote, go to court, file their claims, not against states, states and not against individuals in their official capacities, but individuals who worked under color of authority to become state actors and burden the rights of the plaintiffs and those similarly situated. So in that regard, anyone, any person that threatens or burdens or infringes upon one's right to vote for president is doing a dirty deed. And that's the whole point because that right belongs to you that right belongs to the plaintiff. And that right is so treasured, is so valuable, that if there are entities that are violating that right, or burdening that right, 
cannot be said that I can't sue them for damages, particularly if I can point to a particular election, the 2020 presidential election, at which, during which, they violated the plaintiff's rights. Now, does that require overturning the election? I think it would require sufficient evidence that it made a difference. Oftentimes, the, the reasonable uh, approach would be, well, to a probability, might it have made a difference? And of course, the jury would say, well, of course, it may have made, probably made a difference. That doesn't mean you unearth the election. That doesn't mean that the jury, upon awarding damages to the plaintiffs against the defendants who so violated the plaintiffs' rights, would have to then, you know, change the president or, or remove somebody or, or anything like that. I think a lot of these expert reports that we've been criticized for using, people look to for scientific certainty. And you get criticized because, well, this one report may not be to a scientific certainty. Well, that's not the standard. When, when persons come to court, the, the civil standard is to a probability. Is it probable that through the actions of these defendants, the result was changed? Now, isn't that yes? And although you could look at 70 million or so people that voted for President Trump, aren't the other people that voted for other candidates also vested in an honest, fair system that provides the right to expression, the, the right to vote, uh, the right to due process? Aren't they just as invested in that system? And although they may not feel the pain as much because their candidate got elected, well, aren't they also damaged by those who, through their conduct, essentially destroy the fairness of that system? Might they also claim damage as well? I mean, if I voted for a candidate and that candidate won by subterfuge or unconstitutional conduct, I may not be as damaged, but I would be upset that I'm participating in a system that does not provide those constitutional protections. So however you slice it, I think this concept of class action, civil rights, right to vote through our personage, through the secular right of voting, which has nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with race, nothing to do with gender, really nothing to do with our inalienable rights, but everything to do with the rights of the persons who are registered to vote. By that, it cannot mean corporations because no corporation has the right to vote. It cannot mean foreigners because foreigners don't have the right to vote. It cannot mean those people who are not registered to vote because although they hold the sovereignty and they kind of depend upon the government because they're people and they're interested in a fair government, but because they choose not to register to vote or because they're not qualified to vote doesn't mean they're not part of the people. They're just not part of that class that has that right. So they don't have the right, but for those that do and can point to private actors that are engaged in state action or otherwise government officials who are violating the Constitution under color of that official authority, it cannot be said that those voters are frivolous when they approach the court in honor with counsel with evidence. So in the end, I guess we could lose. I guess the sanctions may stick and I guess whatever happens after that will just have to happen. But in the end, I think some of these foundational issues are important to establish before we move further into some of the other issues that we need to resolve uh, as part of the framework in which we must operate to be able to assert these rights. Because what we're doing now with all the audits and depending upon attorney generals and looking to the government, 
none of it's working. So this was our approach. This was our little um, part of the picture. This is, this is our, our way of vindicating our rights. And we have been heavily criticized and we have been sanctioned and we have been penalized, I can tell you that. So, as I say, at the end of all these podcasts, thank you very much. Hang in there and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. And it's there I'll stay and shall persist to the world sees this injustice. Power to the people I will lament. The bank should not run the government. Yeah, I better be prepared to stay there for a while. Thank mm-hmm. you.